This is a presentation we call More Mileage from Your Garden. I'm Janet Makanovich. My website is GardenAZ.org and I'm, I'm honored that the Ann Arbor Farm and Garden uh, Group would ask me to present this for their fundraiser this year. So let's see if we can get you more mileage from your garden. It occurred to um, a very good friend and, and client of mine. I was out doing something in her garden and uh, she came out and we talked for a bit and she looked at me and shook her head and said, you sure get a lot of mileage out of a garden. And I, I, I didn't know exactly what she meant, but I liked the phrase and I thought about it a lot and realized that most of us do maybe what I do and certainly what my husband Steve does. Steven's not with me today. We um, help with the kids, the grandkids virtual school two days a week. And so he's taking my place being the combined teacher aid, lunch lady, um, uh, hall monitor and playground ref for four elementary school kids. Otherwise he would be here because we like to garden and both of us talk to plants. I think probably a lot of you do too. Maybe it's because nobody's out there with us and we wanna tell somebody about what we're doing or what we're thinking, but I do talk a lot. And if somebody will come out, I'm glad to talk to them. Um, I, I think a lot of us like the idea, excuse me, <laughs> like the idea that there is somebody out there who cares about some of this stuff. It's one of the reasons I started writing is because I learned so much talking to other people. And so when I started writing for the Detroit News and I wrote there for 13 years, it was all question and answer. I was learning as much from the questions people were asking and from the conversations that started because I would respond to people's questions as, then, as I was finding out by researching. So uh, Steve and I, he does most of the pictures. I do most of the words, but we both uh, cross over. We started the website Garden A to Z so that we could write new stuff all the time, that we could not be writing the same thing over and over again, but keep on keep on growing and hand off to other people what we'd already found. Uh, and this this webinar, this whole effort that we do in the wintertime is, is part of that. So I'm calling it more mileage from your garden. And it has to do with um, sharing your garden more with people who maybe don't know that they want to share your garden with you. I'm, I'm positive that some members of my family look out, uh, come by, look out in the yard, see that I'm outside and go, oh, she's out there again with the plants. Well, that's all they think is with the plants and Janet likes her plants, but there's a lot more to plants. They are, they are the world uh, for us as gardeners. Certainly they're up there in the top, but they are the world. They were here before we were. They provide the food, the oxygen, the clean water, the, everything that happens in the world happens because of plants. And so there should be ways that we can rope more people into being at least interested in what we're doing and give us a chance to spread our gardening love out further than what we're doing right now. So I'm, I broke it into three pieces. Um, they're kind of loosely called what they're, what they're about. This talking to plants is my first chapter. At the end of the chapter, we'll stop. If there's any questions, we can talk aloud and then we'll go on from there. Um, so I, I'm gonna be working through an outline that starts, it looks like this on the first page. Yeah. It's uh, in the chat menu today, there is a, uh, a, a URL, a, a link so that you can download it or it's on my website, gardenatoz.org. If you click about us and webinars, there's a whole list of conference materials and you'll find more mileage from your garden on that list and you can click and, and get it anytime you want. You shouldn't need it. I'm gonna show you where I am as I go along because I need it to keep straight what the heck it was that I'm planning to do in something that's new. I'm starting with talking to plants. One of the things that I, 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 I hear people doing is talking to plants. But I don't hear very many people asking their plants questions. And I think one of the ways that I get a lot more out of the garden, and I think other people can too, is talk, is ask them questions, go and, and go beyond catalogs and the garden itself. Um, there's Google indexes and books, people, even non-gardeners that you can ask questions of. Don't tell them something, ask questions of it. Um, ask of sister plants, find another plant like it and, and ask, well, how come you look like this and mine looks like that? Um, and what I'm doing is going through today, 10 plants with you where I did ask questions and consult Google and indexes and other people because plants are, they, they appear in encyclopedias and histories and medical books. They're, they're everything, probably not in sporting books. Um, there's some stuff in golfing, uh, but it usually don't find too much in there. Um, and as I go along, I'm always looking for more questions, 
not just answers, but more questions and following new trails. That's a great way to engage the interest of others is to have information that, that goes, that branches out from where you started. For instance, I, I got to wondering about the first plant that my husband um, picked the plants. I said, you pick the plants, I'll do the, I'll do the, uh, the mileage. He said, well, do hemlock. We like hemlock. I said, okay, hemlock. Uh, Suga canadensis, the Eastern hemlock. I said, well, the first thing I'm gonna ask is why the heck is it called a hemlock? Um, it, it's not the hemlock of Socrates' time of, of the poison. Uh, that's a plant that's related to Queen Anne's lace and, and is native to Europe. Although the European gardeners, yay us, brought it here as a pretty plant and the poison hemlock is now naturalized in all 50 states and all of the provinces of Canada. Um, it's not as deadly as our own native Western poison hemlock that's off in the Pacific Northwest, but it's nowhere near a tree. Uh, so why is it called hemlock, I wondered. So I went looking and found in, in some references to, about some of the early explorers and, and visitors to the, the, uh, the colonies or the, the new land that they looked at this tree, didn't know what it was and said, well, it's got leaves that look like the poison hemlock. This is poison hemlock, um, conium maculatum. And this is hemlock. Now it's a weeping hemlock, but you can see that brush-like effect. And they said, okay, so they look the same. I personally think that ferns look more like this and, and you could have come up with something better than calling it hemlock. So what they did is they looked at this tree that they didn't know what it was and said, it looks like a spruce, has leaves like the hemlock. So they called it a hemlock spruce. So the first thing that happened was it lost its name um, because it had a name. Um, but even looking at then hemlock, I said, but, but why hemlock? Why was something called hemlock? It's such a, a hard word. Um, the dictionary tells us that it's possibly from hem meaning poison, but it's an unknown origin where hemlock came from. Um, the tips of the branches of hemlock and the inner bark are very full of, of uh, antiseptics. They make a tea, they can cure scurvy, they're not poisonous. Um, so why hemlock? And it's such a, such a hard word, such a harsh word, I think. Um, it's, it, it is not a great plant for wood, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, uh, the people who came here originally wanted wood. That was one of the main drivers that moved people from the old world to the new world was the need for wood. Um, and the wood on hemlock wasn't good. They just thought it was good for tanning leather. The bark was good for tanning leather. They would literally strip the trees of bark and leave them standing to die and just take the bark off of a hemlock. So talk about, talk about really defaming a tree um, to, to deal with it that way. It does though turn out that hemlock is very good for things like stairways, steps and ladder rungs because it wears very, very well, especially when it's aged and older stuff. Um, it is also, it's a keystone species, hemlock. In the, um, in the Great Smokies, the, the fact that there are hemlocks means that there are hundreds of other species there because the hemlock creates an environment, it's part of the reason that the Smokies are smoky is because there is this blanket over hundreds and hundreds of square miles, millions and millions of hemlock trees that hold um, moisture in around the mountains and create that misty kind of effect. Uh, and that misty effect and that atmospheric humidity allows many other plants and some of the mosses and algaes that are growing here to be able to live in that, in that vicinity. Um, there are some other evergreens in the Smokies, but if you look at this patch right here, it's uh, in the late fall, some plants have already finished dropping their leaves and you're looking at just their skeletons. Some like the, uh, the tulip poplars and the um, sourwood trees are, are just going green, uh, going to fall color. But the dark green that you see there is almost entirely hemlock. Uh, and there is no other evergreen that's ready to step into its place if something happens to the hemlock. The Smokies is one of the parts of the United States that was lost, uh, that lost huge forests, huge as in billions of trees, but also huge as in sizes of trees. Some of these trees, you could put six people hand to hand and not get around the, the trunk of the tree. 
but they died in a chestnut blight in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And that blight still exists and is still killing any chestnut that tries to re-sprout, which they still try to do. But when the chestnuts died, other similar deciduous trees like oaks and uh, elms and tulip poplars were there to move into those spaces and fill the niche. There are no other evergreens positioned and, and able to move into the niche if something happens to the hemlock. So they're a keystone species, especially over waterways. The hemlocks keep the, the area around the water warmer in the winter and cooler in the summertime so that the species of fish that are there, the kinds of salamanders that are there, the kinds of wildflowers that grow along the edge are there because of that temperature moderation. So they're a major important plant. Uh, they're also real high wildlife, wildlife value. A lot of birds um, live on the seeds and on the insects that live in the seeds and on the branches of the hemlock. They're also able, uh, um, like some other evergreens are, to occupy very, very tight niches in, in small spaces and get a footing so that a rocky face like this someday becomes like this. Literally, this was once a solid rocky ledge and has been broken up over eons of trees growing on it. And it is because keystone species were able to get started and going. So to defame that tree and just leave it sitting um, with its bark stripped to die. These are trees that can live to be 600 years old. It was just a terrible thing to do. And it's in now, not back when, but now it's in a fight for its life, um, the hemlock is. They're, we're using some biological defense strategies that I wanna tell you about. All of these things being things that I started out with just trying to find out why is it called a hemlock and, and found out about this, some things that I did not realize. This is the underside of a branch of hemlock. And if you can see the white spots here, here, and here, you're looking at hemlock woolly adelgid. It's an aphid um, type insect that is lodged at the base of that needle and is sucking the, nu the nu nutrients out of that needle. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid came from China. In China, the, the trees that it feeds on there seem to have some resistance to this and the numbers of adelgids don't build up, but here they do build up and give it three to 10 years and the hemlock dies, literally starved to death by all of these adelgids living on it. Uh, right now, they stand. we stand to lose all of the hemlocks in the, in the Great Smokies. We've already lost 75% of the hemlocks in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, and it is moved, it is, in, it is in Michigan now. It is something that we need to, to watch for. It can be controlled with soap twice a year at the right time before the woolly stuff appears on the aphids to spray with soap on the undersides of the leaves thoroughly to kill the, the aphids and then do it when the second generation comes out again. Um, it's also possible to use a systemic insecticide that's put onto the ground and absorbed into all parts of the plant so that when the adelgid sucks on it, it's sucking in poison, not just the plant. Um, but that's not practical to do for millions and millions of trees, not practical to do for a forest. So instead, what's, what's going on in these areas, so uh, if you can see the gray firs that's in here, some of those are deciduous trees that have dropped their leaves, but not this one not this one, not that one back there. Those are dead hemlocks. They are dying. There is a problem with them. The, the Great Smokies and the United States Forestry Service have been working um, since, the adelgid showed up in the 1950s, but in the 1990s was recognized as a really severe problem. In the late 1990s, they began releasing a beetle um, that was collected from uh, Asia. It's a relative of our lady beetle. This is our, one of our lady beetles. We have a number of them and there are a number of them all through the world. The one that they're, uh, that they're bringing in likes to eat hemlock woolly adelgid. Its name is actually, um, oh, they changed its name. It's Sensigi simonis adelg uh, sugii for suga for hemlock uh, because it prefers to eat hemlock woolly adelgids. It is about as big as a poppy seed. So it's about as big as um, one of the spots on our this the regular ladybug here, but it likes to eat these these adelgids. So they've been bringing them in and raising them. There are five places in the country that can raise them and sell them, and releasing them. And found that where they do release them into uh, an infested adelgid infested stand, they're 
cutting the numbers of adelgids down by half to about 90%, 47% to 87%. So they say, well, this could work. It costs about a dollar a beetle and uh, they need millions of beetles to be released and it takes some time to get them raised. Um, this is not packaging from beetles, but, uh, but packaging from a different biological control. The biological control companies that are raising them are raising them to be shipped to people. For instance, you could buy a colony of 250 uh, for about uh, a colony of 100 for about $250 to release in your trees. Um, so we, they did find that there's something there and we're trying and seeing if that will work. Now, along the way, asking questions, I go, well, how does one go about finding out whether or not they're eating these adelgids? Well, there is a, another issue at stake here. The um, woolly adelgid that attacks the hemlocks is related to woolly adelgids that attack and are native to our, our own forests and, and feed on larch. And cons conservationists and the environmental studies people are concerned that if we release keep releasing these beetles and get them established in the United States, they will eat the woolly adelgids on other plants. And one of those woolly adelgids on the larch and a couple of others is eaten by the only butterfly in, in North America that eats, that is a carnivorous butterfly, that eats adelgids um, as both a caterpillar and as an adult. So that's amazing. So the researchers are taking these cat, these ladybugs. I don't have a picture of the of the, the little black one that eats the. But imagine that you have a petri dish on one side with a branch loaded with aphids from plant A, and a, a petri dish, and on the other side of the dish, a hemlock loaded with hemlock woolly adelgid. And your job is to count the aphids, starve your beetle for 24 hours, set your beetle down between the two branches and then wait 24 hours and count how many aphids of which kind it ate to find out what their preference is for what they eat. So far, the results are that the one they're importing looks like it prefers only to eat or primarily to eat the hemlock woolly adelgid. And so they're thinking we can keep releasing that. This is the uh, larvae of a ladybug. They also eat uh, aphids. They're vicious little creatures. So that's the kind of stuff you find out and gives you things to talk to other people about besides just how much you like the looks of your hemlock. Uh, and once you get to talking to people about hemlocks or about these biological things, and you realize that you really like your, your hemlock a lot, um, you can give gifts of almost any kind of plant. We know we divide plants, we give our seedlings and things that come up, but we can even do the woody plants. Um, in looking through information about hemlocks, I found the information that layering has been successful. Uh, whereas growing from cuttings is not so successful and growing from seed takes a long time. Layering, well, what's layering? It's scraping the bark, injuring the bark on a branch and pegging it down against the soil so that the injured part of the branch as it heals itself forms roots. And that's what we intend to do. Steve and I, who loves and, and selected hemlock for me to look into because he loves the sergeant we weeping hemlock, which is what you're looking at here. And if that branch is close enough to the ground over here, we can scrape the underside of it, put it in a little furrow, bury it, hold it down with something so it doesn't come up, tip the end of the branch up, kind of important to tip the end of the branch up and make it dominant so that then this will form roots. And someday when someone is coming by and admiring your tree, you can cut right here, dig right there and give them their own clone of your Sergeant Weeping Hemlock. I wouldn't have thought of, of uh, doing hemlocks like that. That, that uh, information came from Michael Durr's book where he talks about the types of hemlocks out there. There are about 56 kinds or, of, of hemlock, uh, short ones, squat ones, white edge ones, and like this one here. He says, most of them are so ugly that adjectives don't serve, but the Sergeant Hemlock, that one that we just looked at, and this one, and this one, are such gorgeous trees that probably everybody needs to have one. So let's all go out there and grab that tip branch and layer it and see if we can get something given to someone else. That's uh, at the Arnold Arboretum, which is one of those places where you can go to see just about any plant in the world. Um, if you understand that this is not a forest, this is collected and displayed trees of all kinds, 
not just a forest. But back to the carnivorous butterflies, because that one got me. I said, wow. So I went to look for what carnivorous butterfly is there. Um, it's this butterfly. It's called the harvester, kind of a cute little guy, about the size of the, uh, the, the cabbage whites that come to your, your kale and broccoli. This is its caterpillar. The caterpillar eats aphids entirely. That's all it eats. The uh, butterfly sips like ants do, sips the honeydew that, that uh, um, the, aph the adelgids secrete does not drink nectar like other butterflies do. It's the only species we know of butterfly in North America that does that. And it's entirely possible that under these adelgids right here is a caterpillar because the caterpillars in feeding on them are sometimes harassed by ants because ants want the honeydew from the adelgids also. They're sometimes harassed by ants which protect the plants, the adelgids that they're, they're milking. Um, so the caterpillar will cover itself with the bodies of adelgids and feed from underneath, which I think is all entirely fascinating and is stuff that all just came up from looking for what, why something was called a hemlock. And now I have a conversation starter for my nephew's wife is an indigenous person. And uh, I, I didn't even realize that, um, that she was. And I can talk to her about the fact that this used to be called Onita was the name of hemlock. Onita, and it has the right to the name Onita. How somebody who doesn't even know a spruce from a pine or from a hemlock who called it hemlock spruce gets to name it hemlock. And why we have such a hard, harsh word like hemlock when we had Onita before, I can talk to her about. Um, I can talk about my brother-in-law who likes to look up the sources of words. And for all I know, he'll find something better than what I found. Um, you can talk to chemistry students about what's in the, what the antiseptic is in that makes the tea what makes the vitamin C and the scurvy uh, cure that the hemlock needles can get you. Um, if you've got a grandkid that's into history. So all of these things are places, are, are things that we got to talk about and we've now gotten more mileage out of one plant in our garden. Uh, I won't take so much time for the rest of them because I think you see how it works. Virginia bluebells, a lot of people have Virginia bluebells. So that's a beautiful plant. Fleeting in that it's not there in the summertime but beautiful um, Mertensia virginica with a lot of names, cowslip, Roanoke bells, Mary bells, um, beautiful blue flowers. And don't we love blue flowers? Isn't it one reason that any plant with blue flowers is going to be on everyone's list to have in their garden? Springtime blue flowers. Um, uh, there is some information that says that, that blue is probably the least uh, common of the plant, fl plant flower colors most common in high altitudes and in cool locations. And so looking at something like um, Virginia bluebells. That's funny. I didn't think I had this picture here. Um, like Virginia bluebells really makes us say, oh, I think I want to have that. We'll come back to this one a little bit later because it's, it's a different bluebells than you might think it is. This one is bottled gentian, which has before not been something you can buy, but lately you've been able to buy some of the hybrids. This one's called true blue. As long as you've got really, really well-drained soil, this one's growing in a raised bed of sand that I made out of just builder's sand and does very well, blooms in August. Isn't it gorgeous? But back to Virginia bluebells, why is it called Mertensia virginica? I said, why are you Mertensia? What the, who, what's, what's Mertensia from? Well, it's, come, it's from the Honorable Mr. Mertens. Uh, he was a German phycologist. Well, there, there's this question I got to set aside. What the heck is a phycologist? I thought it was a typo. Nope, it's a phycologist. Phycology is the study of algae. This man studied algae, but he taught theology and language at a university in Germany. Why these things work this way, I don't know. But he studied botany in his spare time, going all over Europe with his friend, um, Mr. Roth. And Mr. Roth is the one who named the genus of blue flowering plants that our Virginia bluebells is part of, Virginia bluebells. But Mr. Mertens, Professor Mertens, never saw Virginia bluebells. Um, Virginia was once the entire southeast quadrant of North America. Those settlers who first, those colonists who first were sent to Jamestown uh, in that terribly faded uh, time when most of them were gonna die in the first winter, 
uh, they were sent there to claim that for the Virgin Queen, and they claimed all, everything. So clear to the Mississippi, on up to, on up to Michigan, that was all of Virginia. So here was this plant that occurred in that area, and it by George was related to the one that, that Mr. Mertens was named, uh, was named for Mr. Mertens in uh, Germany. So they named our Virginia bluebells Mertensia virginica, the Mertensia of the, that land. It uh, starts out purple, loses the purple pretty quickly, and then you see the flowers coming. They rapidly extend themselves up and do that wonderfully, wonderfully endearing thing of starting out as pink buds that expand and change to blue. Uh, one of the things that makes blue flower, it, it's common in blue flowers to have this change and the change uh, appears to be associated pretty strongly with, with pH or acidity that inside the tissues of the leaf the pH is changing from alkaline to acid. And just like litmus paper, the tissues of the plant are registering that, that change in acidity. And those pigments, which aren't there in the white one, so it's a pretty variety of the white one, but it doesn't do that thing. It's, it's a lot losing the pigments. The pigments appear to have a, a good deal of nutritional value and maybe medicinal value. More on that a little bit later. Now, of the of the other Mertensias, there are some there are others that are from North America. So Mr. Mertens and his friend Albert Roth wouldn't have seen them. One is called low uh, bluebells, Mertensia humulus. Humulus means low, and it is so prolific it turns the Wyoming hills blue in May. Now I've not been to see this, so instead I'm showing you the colors of it. It's just a it's a short, very short, only about six inches tall, but so full, so wonderful that in Wyoming, if you're in any of the hills, not the lowlands, but the hills, not the mountains, but the hills, um, in May, the whole thing is blue from the, the low bluebells. Um, there is also another that's along the shore, along the Atlantic shore, Rutensia maritima. It's name telling you it's of the maritime provinces. And this one, it's uh, once I went to look for it for you, for you so that I could show you the things I was finding out and the, the mileage I was getting out of the garden. Once I saw this, five seeds of Mertensia maritima, very rare. I went, okay, on my list. Got to try that one someplace. Um, and Mertensia ciliata is the fringed Mertensia or rocky mountain Mertensia. And I didn't actually have to look it up because Steve came up to me and said, no, 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 we have that one. It's this one. Now that I tell you, can you tell that the leaf is different than the one that we have normally? This one, the leaves don't go away as quickly. It's a more lasting presence, kind of like a, a bleeding heart. It's gonna be around until August, so it might be a better one to do. Alan Armitage says he doesn't understand why more people aren't selling this one rather than our, our uh, Eastern one. Now about those shifty colors, about that purple or pink and then blue, and it being kind of common, most scientists have said this is this is a cue to pollinators. It has nothing to do with us people. Plants don't care whether we we like how their colors change, but pollinators are noticing those colors. They're reading the UV frequencies frequencies of the colors and are can tell when it is blue that it is ready and has has pollen and nectar that they can collect or or drink. Um, but we found that because it has something to do with pH, that's the the uh, mechanism of antioxidants working inside the cells. And now antioxidants, if you look at any medical text, we've realized have a lot to do with good health. They have a lot to do with new cancer research, with um, blood diseases. Um, and in plants, we already know that there are at least 300 different kinds of antioxidants. And we do know that some of these plants are loaded with antioxidants. The Cherokee used Virginia bluebells for whooping cough and the Iroquois used it as a poison antidote. And if you look in the USDA's phytochemical database, we'll get to that a little bit later, you'll find that by George, Virginia bluebells has a, a heavy concentration of antioxidants in it, particularly when it is still purple. And now the name oyster leaf bluebells for the mar maritime ones makes sense because they supposedly taste like oyster when they're in that condition, when they're most, uh, most ripe to be used for medicine. Isn't that kind of cool? And you don't hurt anything by taking leaves off of plants. Not if they've been there for a while. Anybody who has them know that these things spread and become big colonies. 
some designers tell you not to plant lots of them because they leave big bare spaces when they go away. I don't mind that they leave big bare spaces because I fill them with something else. That dramatic entrance and the early exit, I think makes room for things. I tell people put painted fern there. Ellen Armitage says add annuals in. Steve Still and Pamela Harper say, well, they use hosta there. Um, here's painted fern coming up while the bluebells are still blooming. And by the time they're going dormant, the painted fern will have spread itself out over the area, just as a hosta would spread itself out over the area. Um, or grow the Siberica, Mertensia um, uh, Siberica, the Siberian one, or the fringed one from the Rocky Mountains that last a little bit longer. And one last thing about Mertensia that made me think of Miss Wilmot's ghost. Ellen Wilmot in, uh, in England designed and, and maintained a, a famous garden, now gone. It's not one of the ones that became part of the National Trust, but she was well known among the gardeners of the 1930s and 40s and visited a lot of those gardens and would take with her seeds of some of her favorite plants, including a uh, sea holly that's now named Miss Wilmot's ghost or Ellen Wilmot's ghost because she would scatter the seeds in someone's garden and they would say, Ellen's been here and dropped seeds around there. Well, if you have bluebells and you're waiting for them to do, see they're starting to go yellow and doing that thing that they do where the chemicals in the developing seed are telling the stem to elongate and lay out so that the seed falls over here, not right down into the crown of the original plant. If they're looking like this, wait about a week and then just cut them off. Don't worry about hurting it, cut it off. Um, they don't need to stay there the whole year and just take those seed pods and start dropping them in your friend's gardens and see if they say, I have this plant that came up. It would be kind of fun to do. And you would understand why Miss Wilmot liked to do that too. Next plant is striped maple. It's a little maple. It's a native maple, also called moosewood. Um, it's a beautiful plant, fast growing, belongs in the understory, does not ever belong out uh, beyond the understory. Um, it has a big leaf on it. Um, bigger when it's younger, but still a big leaf on it that turns a nice yellow in the fall. It's hard to tell you how nice the yellow is. It's a yellow that glows like warm butter, and it's a yellow that comes late in the year. This is a young one in, in our yard. It's called striped maple because the new wood, the young branches, are striped. And on a couple of varieties, including one called erythrocladum, which is a terrible name, um, the uh, striping, it, uh, the pattern is red uh, bark and white stripes and very, very pretty, especially on the younger branches. Now it's on the list because Steve picked the plants for me and he picked the maple. So I was looking up why it was called striped maple. And I couldn't get away from the maple part of it because I needed to tell you what I found out that was, just blew me away. Other people didn't think to tap maple trees. They have maple trees in Europe. They have the Norway maple, they have black maple, they have a number of maples. But for whatever reason, they didn't tap trees for sap. Um, the, uh, the, the Russians tapped birches, the Koreans tapped some maples for sap, they drank sap. But our native peoples were taking the sap and boiling it down to make it syrup or rendering it to be syrup. So here are these Europeans who come here to look around and go, wow, there are several trees to cut when the sap poured out with such fine and delicate taste as good as the wine of Orleans. I mean, really, a liquor that runs from the trees toward the end of winter, collected and drunk by the natives. Um, that was a, a hundred year, uh, over a hundred year spread. They still just were amazed at what was going on here. At the time it was birch, birch bark buckets that the uh, natives were putting there. And the natives um, lore it says that nobody really knows who did the first one, whether it was somebody who accidentally um, uh, notched a tree or whether it was someone who's just saw some sap dripping and, and, and put a finger in it and licked it and thought it was good, but they used it for everything. They cooked their meat in it um, as sap. They rendered the syrup and used it as, uh, as syrup on uh, sweetening, sweetening for everything. They use it as a base for medicines and they didn't always boil it. If they boiled it, they put it in Imagine the, the trees that they hollowed out as canoes. They would hollow out a tree and put the sap in it and add and, and make rocks really hot and put hot rocks in it to boil it. Or they would put it in that open container and leave it out on freezing nights and keep scraping the ice off of the top until they ended up with granulated uh, remainder, which was the syrup, and then keep that in their pouches. So the settlers started collecting syrup too. And still, this is the maple syrup area of the world, really when it comes down to it. 
And there were a lot of people that were just blown away like that. Um, and a lot of botanical adventures that started for my grandson, who is definitely into adventure stories right now. Uh, Farmer John Bert Bartram is one that he's going to hear about from me. Um, John Bartram in uh, the in Pennsylvania, one of the uh, third generation colonist, a Quaker, was very interested in plants and in his off time was collecting things and made the connection with uh, Mr. Collins, Collinson, uh, for which one of my favorite plants, Collinsonia, ends up named, who was a seller of plants in London, who became his agent, told him how to pack things, what kinds of things people would want to have, and John Bartram began collecting became a friend of Ben Franklin's who really admired the things he was picking up. He was commissioned by the king as the king's collector of plants. He journeyed from Pennsylvania down to Florida, up to, uh, up to Ottawa, all around uh, in his spare time. His sons, John and William followed after him and did the same thing. And they collected thousands, tens of thousands of, of specimens, seeds, pressings, um, lore of the use of the plants and sent them back or over to Europe and made their fortune doing that. Um, he wrote a book, or a book was written about him, I can't remember which one it is, called Travels. The English ladies at the time, this was in the uh, 1700s, swooned over this adventurous person who would go off into the wilds. Uh, this is in the Porcupine Mountains. I don't think he made it that far up into, into Michigan, but he did make it into that territory. And now, now, now look at this guy. <laughs> Does this look like a gardener? Does this look like somebody you would talk to? Because plant explorers didn't just bumble around out in the wild. They went and found settlements and asked people, what plants are around here? What do you use? What do you use them for? Would you talk to, I would talk to him. I would say, sure, if you're interested in my plant, I would do that. John Bartram. And on this moosewood or striped maple, it's a great forcing plant. For those of us who do cut flowers and like to arrange things and enjoy them inside, this is one where you cut the budded branches in the late winter before the buds burst open. Soak them right up to their necks in, in, in the warmish water, lukewarm water, and then put them in a sunny place for, oh, seven days, and they will, they will uh, bud out. The female trees are best because there are separate female and male trees on the striped wood, uh, on the striped maple and the female trees won't have any pollen, so they won't be staining your tablecloth when they open. But look at the flowers. They are not your typical maple flowers. They're more like the David maples, and, and they're beautiful just in bud. Isn't that a great thing to have? And it happens to be called moosewood because nature's own coppicers take care of it. And the coppice is to harvest young wood for making tool handles, for weaving, for making fences, for decorating things. Um, and to coppice means that you cut and now you get a bunch of branches coming and you cut again and you get a bunch of branches coming. And that's what happens for those of you who have deer and say, can I plant it? Deer like it. Um, and if they're going to browse on it, you can at least say to yourself, well, I'm glad I don't have moose uh, because they will browse on it, but it will butt out from behind where they, where they cut. It'll stimulate buds back there to grow. So it'll look bushy, but it'll still grow and still give you more branches to use. You'll have your own coppice wood. Goat's beard is the fourth one in the, in the uh, talking to plants. Goat's beard we call Aruncus dioicus is native through the middle part of North America, uh, the hills of Georgia to Indiana, across to uh, where, where the Great Plains start. Uh, it's not good in the South, not good where it's hot at all, but in the woodlands, it's where it belongs. And it's got some other names, child of two worlds, bride's feathers, and buck's beard. Now I can follow goat's beard, buck's beard, which is the Finnish name for it. My husband is Finnish. Or bride's feathers. I've not seen bride's feathers, but the USDA holds fast that that's its name. But child of two worlds. I said, why are you called child of two worlds? It's because goat's beard is another plant that is dioecious. Its name says so, Aruncus dioicus, means it's dioecious or it has separate male and female plants. And the female plants are not as showy in flower as the male plants are. The male plants have extend themselves more because their stamens are sticking out with the pollen on them. Um, but the female flowers make better dried arrangements because they have uh, more substance to them when they form seed. It's the, uh, uh, host plant for the skipper called the dus dusky azure skipper. 
if you look around in the woods and you're generally going to see him in the woods, you'll find this guy. It doesn't look like much, just a, oh, he's the size of your thumbnail. But when he opens his wings, the blue is azure. It is really a beautiful thing. And I never realized that that's the host plant for it. And that's what it's eating. It's nectaring on things like geranium by the time it, come, it emerges in the spring. But it's a wonderful thing to have in the yard. And like I say, you can use the, the female flowers as a dried flower because the seed pods are gonna form. So the male can be much showier than the female, but the female is going to keep substance as seeds form there. And then these can be hung and dried, spray painted, um, done anything. They're very pretty in the, in the winter time. Um, growers don't sex their plants on goat's beard. So you need to either buy it in bloom and look and see, is there pollen? If there's pollen, it's male. If there's no pollen, it's a female. Um, or you need to buy several and take your chances. Um, a note about the garden pharmacy, the Cherokee would beat the root up. They would take pieces of root, which is not easy to do. They are not easy plants to split up, mash them to a pulp and use that if a bee stung your face. The face, not the rest of you, the face. Why? I don't know. And staunch bleeding after childbirth. Um, there is a, uh, at the, on the last page, you'll find a number of places that you can go looking for information about plants. And they're just the starter things. There's just, there's about a dozen of them there, but they're, they're just the start. It's called Plants for a Future, pfaf.org, um, that rate plants on how edible or useful they are as a medicine. Um, the, uh, uh, operating principle being that we're relying on too few plants to feed the world. And so we need to keep track of which other things have, have uh, use. And you'll find this as a, a number two, two on a scale of five when it comes to edibility. Not the greatest thing to eat, but it is edible. Beautiful plant, goat's beard. And this is the, uh, um, the USDA's database, the phytochemical database that tells us if I look up the plant, what chemicals have been isolated from it and what they are, what they do, what reference indicates that that's what they do, anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, et cetera. In the phytochemical database, you can look up a plant or you can look up a chemical either way and, and you will be astounded at the pharmacy that we're growing in our yards. So that's, that's uh, asking plants questions, asking them about their name. What questions do you have for me? Janet, we did, we did have a question from Patty uh, back about the Eastern hemlock, uh, wondering, is it necessary to treat hemlocks on private property before the problem occurs? Um, not before the problem occurs, watch okay. for the problem. It is but watch for it. Yes, it is present in Michigan, so don't be caught unawares because a couple, a couple, three years of feeding on your hemlock and you could lose major branches and then lose the whole tree. Okay. So, um, so you would uh, shake hands with it and look underside because you'd see those white puffs on the underside. Okay, and then we'll speed along. So that is uh, chapter one um, because chapter two coming up. <laughs>